If Barack Obama came here today, President Barack Obama stepped in today, had a piece of paper in his hand, and just left it up here like this, and walked out. Everybody would try to get that piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why is his, why does the, does the paper go up and, no, it's the person holding the paper, you believe in their value. And why do you believe it? Because they told a story, a story, not the truth, not their biography. They told a story about themselves, which gave them value. When they touch anything now, it has value. This is what hip hop was. This is what this hip hop was before it became this corporate. It was first, um, hip hop. So the mainstream says ripped jeans are, are you throw them out. Hip hop said, no, ripped jeans is now the new fashion. When I was growing up in the 70s, if you ripped your jeans, they had patches. You had iron on patches. You rip your jeans. Oh no, I'm not wearing ripped jeans. You put patches on them. And you iron the patches on over the ripped jeans. Hip hop came out and said, we, we can't even afford patches. We're going to rock these we ripped right here, so I'm going to rip it here, here, and here. That's hip-hop. We did that first. Everybody else was on designer jeans, Sassoon, before that. We took the cheap jeans, Lee and Levi's, rip them up, wear a baggy. We was out like this. But what did the mainstream say? Oh, that's worthless, valueless. The rags we used to get, the hip-hop used to put on their heads in the 90s. These rags, they cost 25 cents for 12 of them. In the 70s. Now you can't get one of them for under $12, $15. They selling them same rags, those same mechanics rags that you see the Crips and Bloods and everybody wearing these same rags. Them rags used to cost 25 cents for 12. <laughs> the minute the Crips start wearing them, a few rappers in the video start wearing them, them same rags that was 12 went up $15, $20, $30 now. People start putting stuff on them, $50 now for a rag. <laughs> Timberland boots, work boots that you bought, laced up, and went to do heavy labor. Hip hop took that, started loosening them up. Uh, no, no, don't scuff up my imagine. Hip hop's like, don't scuff my Tims. And Timberland boots is made to be scuffed up. You put out of all the boots that you can wear, this particular shoe is a construction boot. <laughs> it is made to be scuffed up and, and blackened from the time you put it on. Hip hop said, no, nope. this is the fashion statement. Don't scuff my Tims. I want to keep them fresh. Timberland, the, the, the thing went up. The, 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 the stock, the company, all of it went up. And it was made money out of hip hop, no? No, not at all. Then now back to these dudes. <laughs> they out there, Rolex, just put a commercial out. Rolex just put a commercial out with Dr. Martin Luther King in a commercial. <laughs> come on, y'all, come on. They got Dr. King, said, they said, yo, Dr. King wore Rolex. They said Gandhi wore Rolex. They have a whole bunch of people. They said uh, John F. Kennedy wore Rolex. So Rolex is trying to step up by saying, you know, some of the great minds in the world rock the Rolex. Now, they're taking it back there, but you know how Rolex really got their money over the 90s? Boom! Right here. Actually, it was here. But I, I know Tupac gave Biggie his first Rolex. Big. <laughs> you think Rolex is ever going to come and say, you know, Puffy, oh, yeah, yeah. for all your work with Rolex. Uh, Jay-Z, for all your work with Rolex. Exactly. Uh, but, but we could see with these brothers very live, Okay, with the history of their very lives, we could see how these corporations are really doing us. Now said I went from psycho to Rolex. Oh, you going through the history? Because he meant psycho. Right. Instead of he was poor and broken down, mm -hmm. he was like psycho, psychotic, or something. And he went to Rolex, he became rich. Mmm. Mmm. That's psycho. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> Um, let me bring this. Let me bring this to a proper close. Those that can understand this first half of what we discussed about hip hop, 
what it means to be a hip hop scholar, to be it all the time, to be able to be subjective with your culture, not objective with your culture, to be able to not think like a colonizer, don't try to kill the information, capture the information, this kind of thing, try to be the information. Try to understand what you know from an empathetic point of view, not just I know it, but feel it. This is what the scholarship is all about. We brought, we came over this briefly, collected press. I really want to get into what you started with spirituality. I didn't get into it actually here. Uh, maybe we can breeze over in, in, in Q&A. But uh, we go back over this again uh, to discuss the spiritual nature of hip-hop. We really only got uh, into maybe the philosophical and cultural part. When I say things like hip-hop is not material, uh, this is more philosophical, it's true. Uh, hip-hop doesn't appear anywhere in the physical world, but there's deeper parts to go into that. Like, if it doesn't appear in the physical world, then where is it? Because we all feel it, we all know it, we all operate in it. So what dimension are we really operating in if hip-hop is not in three-dimensional space? If it's not here, then where are we as hip-hoppers, really? Didn't really get into that, but I give you this for you to think about it a little later on. We talking hip hop, for real. Before we even was able to rap, we had to answer these questions first. The angel came. Hip hop, you guys will be the greatest ever, but Tupac, Biggie, Scott LaRock, Big L, Big Pun, Easy E, Freaky Ty, Heavy D, I la la. They all gotta go. Had the angel came to us in 87 and said, listen, KRS, you'll be the greatest MC ever. <laughs> <laughs> but Scott LaRock gotta go. <laughs> <laughs>